We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, just a couple of housekeeping matters. Uh, if you're going to take the final exam, uh, let me say about that, uh, whether or not you're standing for office or not, if you um, plan or think that you may someday do it, you probably will never be better prepared to do this exam than you are right now. Uh, so that would be one thing. You can do the exam and not stand for, stand for office. You can turn in the right written exam and you can uh, stand for office and, and be examined orally as well and then not run, not to have your name go forward. Um, and then next time around, uh, then you would not be uh, have to be uh, re-examined except in your views, not in the content, um, which is a much easier process. Uh, so for that, and I still don't know who is and who isn't standing for office, so if you are, I need to get your biographical sketches to, to fill out the little form that's in your notebooks and get that back to me tonight um, so that we'll be ready to go next uh, Wednesday, which is the review session. Okay. Um, all right, for the quiz, how is Christ present in the supper, and how is he not present? He is present really and spiritually, but not physically. Yeah, so we have a true presence. Um, he is present spiritually. He is not present spiritually, carnally, locally. Um, there is no uh, transformation of the substance of the bread. Uh, so no transubstantiation, and there's no, uh, there's no consubstantiation either. Luther arguing that the, that the, the bread retains its content as, um, as its substance as bread, and the wine as wine. Uh, but, uh, uh, but he is physically present in, under, and with uh, the contents, uh, uh, with, with the bread itself and the cup. All right, the Roman, uh, Roman Catholic view of Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper is called transubstantiation. Luther view is called. Um, the Presbyterian view is that of a blank or true presence, spiritual or true presence. The Baptists, however, believe only in a memorial or symbolic presence. Uh, some Baptists. I should, clar should clarify this. Some. 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 Defective Baptist. All right. Number three, what central doctrine is the key to our understanding of the nature of, of the Lord's Supper? The atonement? Yes, the doctrine of the atonement. Well, it seemed like it could have been the nature of Christ also because it affects what we think about the, 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 the bodily presence of Christ. Yes. But, but the atonement. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's very good, actually. I mean, do, is the physical body of Christ ubiquitous? And if it is, in what sense is it still a human body? So the Reformed have denied the ubiquity of this physical body while they affirm the ubiquity or omnipresence of his spirit. All right, so, so at the right hand of God, is there a man who is truly man? Is he truly God and truly man? If he's truly man, um, does he not retain the properties of uh, physical human beings? So... Reformed theologians have all denied the ubiquity of his physical body. All right, uh, so, but the main thing here is the doctrine of the atonement. All right, uh, four, why do we baptize infants? Uh, do we baptize believers as well? Do we rebaptize those once baptized? So hopefully you have some kind of an answer like we baptize infants because of our understanding of the covenant mm -hmm. and the place of children, the family within the covenant and the parallel between circumcision and baptism as the right of admission into the covenant community. Uh, do we baptize believers as well? Yes. Yeah, we've had, we have, um, you know, three or four bap adult baptisms every year. Dan? I was one of them, so. So there you go. And, you know, Amy Martin was our director of Christian education here for, I don't know, 10 years or so. And as she came into my office, a very distressed look on her face uh, and said, I've just discovered I've never been baptized. And so I said, well, Amy, eternal perdition is <laughs> what awaits a fraud like yourself. Uh, no, so we immediately then the next Sunday we baptized her. Uh, she didn't know. She didn't know. She thought, you know, we assumed that she had been. 
but she was not. So do we rebaptize those once baptized? No. No, and the key thing here is, were, were, was the person baptized in a church? And that includes Roman Catholic people baptized in the Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox. So. It does. It does for me. Not all my brethren agree with that, and I respect both positions on that. Calvin never was Roman Catholic, right? Right. Or any of the reformers. They all accepted Roman Catholic baptism. Later Protestants have been more reluctant. Especially when Rome's uh, positions on justification solidified at Trent. Um, you know, Christ plus. Um, so, uh, so we do rebaptize the Mormon because we're not rebaptizing them. Because they've never been baptized. That's why the Anabaptists, by the way, didn't like being called Anabaptists because they were saying, well, the, the people we baptize never were baptized because those are not baptisms. Um, all right, so do, why did we pour water? Um, hopefully you said the outpouring of the Spirit and the poured out blood of Christ, the pouring is appropriate. Is it permissible to baptize by immersion? Yes. What is the preferred mode and why? Pouring. Okay. All right, uh, question number 92, what is a sacrament? Ready to do that one again? Sacrament is a holy ordinance instituted by Christ, wherein, by sensible signs, Christ and the benefits of the new covenant are represented, sealed, and applied in believers. Just rolls off the tongue. You get the feel for it. Just, it's, it's just rolls, doesn't it? Um, okay. So we are on the last section, and we must finish this tonight. So do keep that in mind. Um, what is the background to the opening paragraph of? Uh, Westminster Confession 30, uh, why is this paragraph in conjunction with 23.1 important? So 30 says, the Lord Jesus as king and head of his church hath therein appointed a government in the hand of church officers distinct from the civil magistrate. Do you know that wars have been fought over that line? Distinct from the civil magistrate. Uh, and, and granted, these are people that believe in a, in a, in a national church. So they, they don't have a problem with having a national church. They do have a problem with the civil government meddle, meddling with the internal affairs of the church. So 23.1 um, said this, God the supreme Lord and king of all the world hath ordained civil magistrates to be under him over the people for his own glory and the public good and to this end hath armed them with the power of the sword for the defense and encouragement of them that are good and for the punishment of evil do doers. And then um, paragraph three, civil magistrates may not assume to themselves the administration of the word and sacraments or the power of the keys of the kingdom of heaven or in the least interfere in matters of faith uh, and so on. So um, there is a battle. There was a battle at the time that the assembly was meeting. And this was what happened. The assembly protested the parliamentary ordinance of March 23, 1646, in which they authorized parliamentary commissioners to receive appeals of church discipline. So these would be, um, these would be political appointments. These are not church-approved appointments. These are parliamentary-approved appointments who are going to make determinations on church discipline. So the assembly finds that intolerable. So parliament, um, parliament, um, parliament responds to the assembly protest by charging the assembly with breach of privilege, which apparently is a big deal. Um, on uh, April 11th, uh, 14, 1646, and issues nine queries regarding the claims of Jus de Venom that is uh, the divine right, and one of the one of the uh, I thought one of the most uh, 
penetrating questions that was raised was by a Scottish commissioner, Archibald Johnson, who asked, is it so small a thing to have the sword that they must have the keys also? Yeah. All right, you have the, the power of the sword. Do you need the keys of the kingdom too? The keys of the kingdom belong to the church. The parliament has no business meddling with church discipline. It's interfering with the internal affairs of the church. So that's the battle going on in China right now, by the way. Right, Wang Yi is in jail because he protested the Chinese government's interference with the inter internal affairs of the church. Denied the Chinese government the right to do that and was able to appeal to the actual to the constitution of uh, the People's Republic, which, which does stipulate religious freedom. And yet the government is, is meddling, interfering with uh, the church in its own affairs. Uh, so the assembly then plowed ahead and approved of Westminster Confession 30, uh, 31, November 26, 1646. Um, in the meantime, the Lo London Presbyterian ministers published uh, just Regiminus Ecclesiasti, Ecclesiastici, uh, December 2nd, 1642. Also, Samuel Rutherford, this, one of the Scottish commissioners, published The Divine Right of Church Government, and George Gillespie, another Scottish uh, 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 delegate, published Aaron's Rod Blooming. Wonderful uh, 17th century title, but you'll remember the event where Aaron uh, is being challenged, Aaron and Moses are being cha cha challenged as to their leadership and the, b the, the blooming of the flowers on Aaron's rod was divine sign that he was the one who was to be uh, a leader. So anyway, that's what he titled his book on church government. Again, uh, the Scots in particular are very sensitive to the encroachments of the civil government into the internal affairs of the church. So next, um, Parliament adopted the Westminster Confession March 22nd, 1648, omitting chapter 30 on church censures. Can you push that? Yep. So it omitted chapter 30 altogether, 31 altogether, and 20 paragraph 4 on Christian liberty, on resistance to lawful authority. However, why do we have these chapters then? Because Scotland adopted all of the Westminster Confession of Faith. August 27, 1647, while politics overtook England. So Scotland adopted it prior to the assembly approving it? Um, no, the assembly approved it in 1646. So it was the... That's point number uh, five. The assembly approves the entire confession December 3rd of 47. Yeah, but that was after August of 47. Right, so, so Scotland approved... <laughs> Yeah, I have no explanation for that. Okay. Um, that is um, what I think, what, if I'm, my memory is serving me correctly, one of the Scots hijacked the thing and took it up to Scotland to get it approved. Yeah. And uh, then it was approved in Scotland, and then it was approved uh, by the assembly as a whole. Um, I better get clarification on that. I think that's what happened. So, yes, I, I believe that's what happened. I think I've got that right. All right, so question. The uh, political and <coughs> ecclesiastical instability is kind of crazy. I mean, it seems like nothing, nothing was permanent, nothing lasted longer than 10 or 20 years, and things changed again. Yes, and so I think that it is all the more remarkable that the confession and catechisms have the calm and clear tone that they do. There's, no, there's, there's nothing in them that would make you, that would give you a hint that a civil war is raging all around them and all kinds of political maneuvering is going on. Um, um, so do you not only have the, the, the combat between the Presbyterians and the Church of England, as it was, the Anglicans, the Episcopal, you know, with those advocating for the Episcopal uh, form of government, the Royalists. So you got the Royalists on one side, you got the Parliamentarians on the other side. Parliament is mainly Presbyterian. The Royalists are mainly um, 
Episcopalian. So you've got that battle. And then within the parliament uh, and the parliamentary army, you have the independents. And so the independents and the Presbyterians are arguing with each other. So you've got all, these, all this political and theological, um, ecclesiastical uh, combat going on. And yet there's this remarkable, calm, clear tone without any um, expression of bitterness or anxiety about what's raging all around them as they deliberate and formulate and come up with the statements uh, and the articles of the confession that they do. Yes? I'm thinking immediately contrast that to Trent, that after every article there are anathemas. Yeah. Yeah, it's more directly combative, I guess you could say. Yeah. Okay. I mean, structurally, the, the assembly didn't conceive that they had the authority to do that. <coughs> Whereas Rome, yeah, you know, Rome long has. Yeah. I won't say all of this, but they would say this has. So the importance, uh, to answer the question, the, the, port, the importance here is that this principle is absolutely critical. That there are two distinct governments that Christ has ordained, and one is the civil government, the other is the church government. And the civil authorities have no right to interfere with the affairs of the, of the, uh, of the, of the, of the church. So that principle, that is established here. They fought for that. Parliament didn't approve it in the end, but the Church of Scotland did, and so it lives on and it crosses the Atlantic with the Scots. Yes. Is one government um, above the other, or has more power or more authority uh, than the other? Um, yeah, I think that that would be the, the critique that I think that we would have. On, in other words, we, we would say this doesn't go far enough because you still have a state religion. And so at some point, uh, presumably the civil government could trump, trump the, the ecclesiastical government. But, you know, ultimately they would have the ability to dis, you know, dismember the church, disassemble the church, direct the church. Because it has the power of the sword. Yes, the church. The yes. church is, I've heard you say that the church's power is really um, just declarative. There's no, there's no force. There's no means right. of force to it. It's it's a, <clears throat> yes, it's a declarative power. So, you know, I've, I've had people come to me and say, um, you know, in, like in cases of abuse, um, they will say, uh, why doesn't the church do something about this, you know, this husband who is abusing his wife? And my, the answer that I, I find myself having to give is, if he is abusing her, she needs to call the police. We have a limited power. We can, we can excommunicate him. I mean, that's not, it's not nothing, right? It's something, but it's just a declarative power. We don't have any way to coerce the person if, if there's abuse. Call the police. And if he's arrested, then you know we'll go to we'll go to work on it, um, and, and do what we can. Which isn't again, it isn't. We, we can't twist his arm. We can't force him. We, but we can, we can we can suspend him from the sacraments. And we can excommunicate him. A couple of deacons might show up and you know take care of some business. Well, I'm not saying that hasn't been done before, but. <laughs> so it seems it seems the political turmoil going on all around this these meetings really affirm this conviction they had. Yes. Yeah, I mean, they fought for it. Yeah. Parliament was deeply offended, this uh, breach of privilege. Breach of, in other words, um, so, so again, it's the ambiguity of the whole situation, which I think it's hard for us to understand. It's hard for me to understand. Par uh, the, the Assembly's a creation of the Parliament. So ultimately, a, a, a Parliament does have, a, a Parliament approves of the confession. So it does have... Um, a final authority because of the way the church-state relationship was. Yes. It, it seems like they, even with the language that's here, there, it sounds like there was a level of understanding that the, the ultimate authority wasn't with Parliament because they subverted that and saw every biblical uh, standing, if you will, to take it up to Scotland and get it approved up there and come back almost as if it was a lesser magistrate. Well, sort of but, well, the Scots were willing to do that for sure, yeah. Yeah, they thought, felt this was a good statement. It's sound. It's solid. Let's take it up and let's get it approved for uh, Scotland, if not for England. Yes. 
How did the assembly view the king? Because the king is the head of the church. Yeah. He's not the head of, he's not, you know, still to this day, you may have noticed with all of the uh, coronation business going on, he is the head of the Church of England. He's a member of the Church of Scotland. So there are two national churches in the United Kingdom. There's the Scottish Church and there's the English Church. He is the head of the Church of England. When he crosses the border, he becomes a member of the Church of Scotland. He's not the head. Um, so you still had a state church, but the king is not the head. You have a state church in Scotland. It's Presbyterian. So you have a state church, but you don't have a, a politician king as head of the church. Remember. Did the king try to go after the assembly then when they tried to say that he was not? Well, there right? is no king at this point. I mean, Charles the second is Charles the first is on the run. So they're fighting a war over this right now. But Parliament. Was it Rutherford that said no king but King Jesus? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure he did. He wrote the book Lex Rex, Law and King, again, separating the king is under the law of God. What um, king said no pope, no king? No bishop, no king. No bishop, no king. Is James, James the first. first. Yeah. No, no bishop, no king. So that's, that's what the Puritans are up against. You know, James I was, we are digressing. Ba James I was, was, was James VI of Scotland. And he was um, of the Stuart royal line, which is, um, which is deeply rooted in France. So Mary, Queen of Scots, you know, she's a French princess. Princess, this ro the royal the royal lines are just very it's all very complicated to us, but but he was brought up as a Presbyterian and he hated Presbyterianism even though he was a Calvinist, and so the Puritans thought oh isn't this wonderful we're getting a Presbyterian king when James uh, crossed the border to become not James the sixth any longer of Scotland but James the first of England, and. Um, was his motto, no bishop, no king. He wanted nothing to do with Presbyterianism. Hampton Court uh, Conference, uh, out of which the Puritans got no concessions, except a new translation of the Bible, which we call King James Version. That's who King James is. And I've heard the ESV called the grand, great grandson of the King James. I don't know if that's true. Well, they, um, yeah. Yeah. They'd like to think they are. <laughs> All right. Qu question number two. Um, what, what is the theological basis for the exercise of church discipline or censures? So here's, here's where I would go for the theological, biblical basis. Um, you can start with uh, Matthew 19. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So there's clearly an authority that's being given. It's being imparted. It's being exercised, not just in heaven, but on earth. And not just on earth, but in heaven. The process in Matthew 18, if uh, this uh, sinner doesn't listen to you, you take two others, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, church makes a declaration about the thing, calling the person to repentance, identifying their behavior with sin or heresy or um, um, d divisiveness. Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And then repeated, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Um, again, John 20, 21 to 23, Jesus said to them, peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, so also, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness of any, it is withheld. <coughs> Uh, so when people say the church should not be judgmental and they want to use that, judge not lest you be judged, as the rationale for um, rebutting the exercise of church discipline, they are ignoring uh, 
a great body of other scriptural evidence that would say that uh, you are misapplying the principle that Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. So as example, 1 Corinthians 5, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reveler, drunkard, or swindler, or even eat with such a one. Well, what have I to do with judging outsiders? Uh, implied answer, nothing. It is not those... Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge or remove the evil person from among you. So that's what excommunication does. Yeah, and he's rebuking the Corinthians for not exercising church discipline. And he says a little leaven leavens the whole loaf. In other words, you leave that untouched and that, that's going to spread. Uh, immoral behavior or heretical doctrines, unaddressed, unrefuted, unrebuked, uncorrected, is like a cancer in the body of the church. And it's going to spread. It's poisonous. It's like leaven in a loaf of bread. It's going to spread, and it will be destructive. So you have to deal with these things. It's the worst thing that we have to, to, have, to have to deal with in the church. But it's, uh, it's, it's a responsibility that the leadership of the church has and cannot uh, avoid uh, more. We uh, now we command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. That's a form of shunning. He's commending it. I don't, I don't think it's an individual decision. I think it, it's it's a decision that's made by the governing body of the church. It comes to an agreement about the behavior of one of the members that is dishonorable and bringing dishonor to the name of Christ. And so what do you do? You keep your distance from them. You, you don't, in other words, you don't, you don't continue in a normal relationship. You don't normalize the evil. There has to be repercussions uh, for, the, for the bad behavior or the bad doctrine or the divisiveness or whatever the case may be. There has to be repercussions. You can't just carry on as though nothing has happened. So, so in one, one case, um, you know, this, uh, this uh, <coughs> member of our church Former trustee uh, decided to divorce his wife and to you know, move in with his, his girlfriend. And it was absolutely devastating to his, you know, his daughters, absolutely devastated by it. And it just you know, it was like torture to her mother, their mother, and she was just grief-ridden. Um, and so they came in to talk to me about it and said, you know, what should we do? And I said, that's what's pretty, you know, pretty plain to me. You can't just carry on normally. It's not when he's doing that to your mother. I said, what if he walked up to your mother and just slapped her across the face or beat her up with, with his fist? Would you just carry on normally? As though nothing had happened and, you know, family vacations and holidays and all that. You just go on as though nothing happened. There has to be some, some kind of a consequence. Something has to change. You can't just, uh, you can't continue as though nothing happened and, 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 and everything is normal because it's not. So I'm, how exactly you, um, you um, give expression to the denormalization of the relationship with your dad, I don't know, but th there has to be a way to do it. Something has to change. Uh, otherwise, you dishonor your mother, you trivialize the pain that he's inflicted on her, you normalize his behavior. Yeah, well, there, there, there was that, but then, the, you know, what about Thanksgiving? Do we get together with them? So, uh, an, another one, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person, have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Have nothing to do with him. But do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.20, as for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. Titus 3.10, for the person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice have nothing more to do with him. So I think the apostles ran a much tighter ship than we do. You know, in Christendom generally today and in our church in, in particular, a much tighter ship. But you can, you can see what, what, uh, what uh, the apostles are requiring. Restoration. Uh, such a one dealing with uh, somebody who was uh, under the discipline of the church, this punishment by the majority is, is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him 
or he may be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. So this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Uh, in Galatians 6, 1 and, 1 and 2, brothers, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual should restore him in such a gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So, you know, I can just see the way we would pick apart a statement like this. Uh, you who are spiritual. So you think you're better than anyone else. You think you're superior to the rest. Well, you know, I think there's a difference between someone who is spiritual and somebody who's not. And we can discern the difference. And we can talk about the difference. And we can identify the difference. That's what's assumed here. Not saying they're, in, in, um, not saying they're perfect. They're just saying these are spiritually minded individuals. Ideally, he's talking about the leadership of the church. If anyone is caught in any transgression, aren't we all sinners? Yeah, we're all sinners, but for some people, the sin is habitual. It's characteristic. And for others, it's not. It's periodic. It's a, a matter of stumbling. And, 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 and holiness is, and, and righteousness is characteristic of the spiritual ones, even though they are not perfect, granted. So these are distinctions that we, we, we really... Uh, get flustered trying to make them today, but um, the assumption is you, you can make these distinctions. You're able to, to um, you know, it's like the qualifications for an officer. An officer is to be above reproach. Who's above reproach? Well, there's a difference. Apparently, there's a difference between being above reproach and not being above reproach. And then we can make that distinction and we can speak meaningfully of it. We can, we can identify it. Um, so there, there are those who are characteristically above reproach, and there are those who characteristically are not. Yeah, Blake. Is, is it appropriate to draw the line at repentance? So in the case of someone who is wrestling with sin, repentant, versus someone who is essentially given up or unrepentant or even says it's not a sin, or hmm. would that be an appropriate line to draw in terms of walking forward? For example, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, um, but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty. I mean, this it seems, well, for the, in the case of the, um, the daughters with the father and the mistress, um, but now I'm writing you, to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is not God or revile or drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Um, that's a pretty comprehensive list of sin that could have been a part of someone's life at one time, but to draw the line of repentance. Are you repenting for this? Are you broken for this? Are you walking differently or are you repenting? As for whether or not discipline is exercised or? Um, no, I'm, t I'm, c I'm asking more so on the personal level. So uh, you have someone who claims the name of brother they may not be under the discipline of your elders, or they may not be under the discipline of, uh, but the scriptures seem to say, don't, don't interact with this person as if everything is okay, Yeah. when it's not. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, interesting. So I, I want to say, as a general rule, when we read this, what we're talking about is official action of the church, not private judgment. I'm not judging you privately, but the church has, has come to a judicial determination because of the sin or the heresy or whatever it is. And so the rest of the church then is to observe that and to, um, and to um, honor the suspension from the sacraments or the excommunication and not normalize, continue to normalize the relationship. All right, so there's that, but how, here's another one. How about this um, person that you know that, um, you know, you're, they're not even members of your church, but they, uh, he, he, same thing, he's, you know, divorced his wife, married his sweetie, and they're going to have a, a party. They're going to have a party celebrating their wedding. Uh, that's happened here in Savannah. It happened a few years back, and just everybody just went and the wife was absolutely devastated. And, um, and they all went and celebrated the, the new marriage. I think that a Christian, a serious Christian, shouldn't go to that party. I, I think you have no business being there celebrating that what was evil. That was an evil thing that he did. And it shouldn't be celebrated. They, I think it was unseemly to have a party, for one. 
and certainly I wouldn't go to it. I wouldn't associate that. I wouldn't, in other words, I'm being asked to celebrate what I can't celebrate. That was evil. She, he didn't have grounds to divorce his wife, but he divorced her, and now he's celebrating the new relationship, which is a sinful, simply contracted relationship. So, some, so uh, you know, there are principles here that I think it, these are a lot of these are wisdom issues. I'm just saying, uh, to me, to, to speak in terms of normal versus normalizing versus not normalizing is that. That, to me, has always been a helpful category. You do that, I can't continue to treat you the way I have. There's going to be a difference. There's going to be a price to pay. There's going to be a cost involved. Yes. A number of these points you're making here remind me of what you were saying last night uh, when it was kind of dealing with bat, uh, professions of faith in terms of baptism. The existence of gray areas does not negate the categories. Right. So you who are spiritual should restore him. Okay, is there going to be a gray area with respect to this particular person, whether he really is spiritual or not? There may be, but there is still the category of the yes. spiritual person, yes. Yes. the not spiritual yes. person. So T. David Gordon talks about the argument of the beard and to be aware of the argument of the beard, uh, which is so. Let's 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 put Aaron and Jackson and Dan on one side of the line. Uh, they're clearly bearded. They're beardos. Uh, and move Neil off a little bit. He's a little more sparse. And o over here, we'll put, put me on this end. I'm pretty clean shaven. And then, you know, the beard gets, you know, the, get, you get, uh, you know, five o'clock shadow and it gets a little heavier. And on the other end, uh, there's a thick, heavy beard, okay? And over here, you got a clean shave. So when does the beard become a beard? So let's say, okay, let's say you say, you, you say it's, it's, it's clearly a beard over there. It's clearly not a beard over there. So I'm going to say it's right here. And so the person says, well, what about this one right here, right next to it? Well, what's the difference between this one and that one? They're right next to each other. Um, you're being arbitrary. You really can't tell the difference between... Uh, when it's a beard and when it's not a beard. And that argument then is used to eliminate the whole category altogether and say, since you can't exactly define where the beard becomes a beard, this whole idea of being able to tell a beard from a non-beard, we throw the whole thing out altogether. We can't tell when a beard, we can't tell the difference between being bearded and not being bearded. That is very, very common in our society today. Um, get, in other words, the refusal to recognize there is a gray area in the middle that is troublesome to us. But that doesn't mean I can't tell that Aaron's got a beard and that Frankie's basically clean shaven. I can tell that. We, we, we can discern those differences. We can tell someone who's above reproach from someone who isn't. We can tell someone who's spiritually mature from someone who isn't. Get in the middle here, it's real hard to tell. There's some judgment calls. But so don't eliminate. So, so, when I first got here, when we were doing officer exams and this sort of thing, it was commonly said, and I had to beat, beat back the statements that, that, well, we all sin. Well, yeah, we all do. Does that mean we, we, we can't, um, we can't um, utilize the characteristics of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1? Do we just throw all the qualifications out because we all sin? Yeah, we all sin, but is there a difference between being above reproach and not being above reproach? Can we... Can we discern the difference? And of course the argument is, of course you can. Of course you can tell the difference. Even though there's some tough calls in the middle. Mm. Well, and, the tough and, calls are good arguments for the Presbyterian form of church government <laughs> of having <laughs> wise elders, yes. appeals, courts. Those systems are in place for the gray areas. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there are tough calls. Yeah. All right, where are we? Um, so there's the theological background. Um, question number three. Uh, the purpose of discipline is described with reference to the offender, others in the church, God. What is the goal of discipline with respect to each? Um, Is not set up there, Jerry. 
This should be, this should be over here. Slide that down here to carry it with you. All right. So paragraph three says, church censures are necessary for the reclaiming and gaining of offending brethren. So principle number one, or whatever order you want to put these, uh, discipline's meant to be remedial. It, it, it's, it's, it, it's not punishment for punishment's sake, per se. It's remedial. It's meant to reclaim. It's meant to awaken. It's meant to draw that person back to their true faith, back to Christ, back to the, the body of believers. So it is for the reclaiming and gaining of offending brother, for deterring others from like offenses, uh, which along with that, for purging out the leaven, which might infect the whole lump. So it's deterring because we recognize that, that it is like leaven. That's, that's straight from 1 Corinthians 5. That will infect the whole lump if we don't deter others by taking this public sin seriously. Uh, vindicating the honor of Christ. His name is attached to the church. That is the point. So whatever the church doesn't correct, it is perceived as endorsing or tolerating or considering to be of secondary importance. So in the choir's class, I've got to use whatever illustrations I have, but in the choir's class, we talked about Texaco back in the early 2000s. They were accused of racism. They took strong public steps to disassociate themselves with whatever racist comments that were being featured and to denounce them and to, um, to guard the reputation of the church and uh, of, the, uh, of the company and its name. Because if they had not, if they had not dealt with the situation, they would have been seen as understanding racism to be uh, something that is not very important. It's real, no real consequence. It's not really a problem. Uh, you know, we all, you know, it, it, they, would have, they, they would have been seen as tolerating it and evil. And so they took strong steps to disassociate themselves with the racist comments. Why? Because it would have dishonored the company, would have harmed the company in the name of the company. Well, that's what happens in the church. So you have, you know, you, you have uh, your elders, you know, the pictures on the, you know, the cover of the newspaper, the DUI. Um, uh, other public public sins. If if it if the church does not act uh, to disassociate itself from that uh, behavior, it is seen as regarding it as of no consequence. So the guy that uh, divorces his wife and marries a secretary is that is that important? Do we take that seriously? Is that is that a serious offense? Is that something that we need to disassociate ourselves from? That we need to um, signal to the world we do not approve of what was done. Do we not need to do that? Is that not important? Um, so, yes, the honor of Christ is at stake because his name is attached to this, this, this body. It is the body of Christ. Um, and the holy profession of the gospel and for preventing the wrath of God which might justly fall upon the church if they should suffer his covenant and the seals thereof to be profaned by uh, notorious and obstinate offenders. So it's, it's spelt out in four points. For the offender to reclaim, for the church to deter, for God to spare his judgment, for Christ, for his reputation. Jerry, can I say something about the pastoral importance of <clears throat> some of this, it seems to me that, that, um, that your relationship to the church and your brothers and sisters in the church is of such vital um, importance to the stability of your life. Mm -hmm. um, If you want stability in your life in terms of um, what you believe and in terms of how you act, in terms of your marriage, in terms of your relationships with your children, uh, being 
invested in the church is the thing that is going to give that stability so that while you are in your right mind, invest yourself in the things of the church, your fellowship, your, uh, your involvements, the things that are most important to you, so that when you begin to lose your mind at times, the um, that drawing effect of the church or that pressuring effect of the church is going to help you not go off the deep end, not do the insane thing. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I of course have a very biased perspective because I'm the pastor of a church, but there are any number of people over the years that, uh, that, that about whom I could say pretty confidently their problems would basically be solved if they were just committed to being um, immersed in the life of the church. Mm-hmm. Under the ministry of the word, Sunday morning, Sunday night, gathering with the saints, enjoying the fellowship of the saints, the presence of Christ in the public service, under the authority of the session, accountable and responsible and all that. So they need above everything else. Just show up. You know, who is it that? Said 90% of life is just showing up. The great theologian Woody Allen. Yeah, Woody Allen. Yeah. Probably like that. Yeah. Yeah. Let me me put that into the notes here for publication. Yeah, you know what? I think it was a, I think, give give credit where credit is due. I think it was a very insightful thing. You know what? Your kid's having a soccer game. Just show up. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a job. Show up. Get there on time. Show up. Do your duty. Church, show up. 90% 90% of life is just showing up and doing what you're supposed to do. And it, it, I'm telling you, I just see it, the, un, the unstable members of our church, so many of them just cannot, for whatever reason, cannot seem to drag their tired carcasses into church on <laughs> Sunday morning and Sunday night. And they miss week after week after week. And then guilt overcomes inertia, and they show up, and then they've been there in weeks and weeks, and they got all these problems and troubles and discouragements. And, you know, I just... What can I do? You won't, you won't do what needs to be done. You need to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, week after week, month after month, year after year, under the ministry of the word, gathering with the saints, etc. You know, I was kidding about a couple of deacons showing up at your door to take care of some business, but, but the, um, the reality of having your relationships and your friendships um, that are that are going to call you to account. Um, you just can't can't overstate the importance yeah. of that. But yeah. You're not you're not making your own decisions fully um, independent of the some, people in your life. There's an accountability here. Right. You want that. You don't think you want that. You think you want autonomy, but you really don't. You need accountability. Very well, true. also protection against temptation. Right? Not just not just the fear of the accountability, but actually the proactive encouragement mm-hmm. to stand against temptation. Yeah. Very good. All right. For the better attaining of these ends, the officers of the church are to proceed with admonition, suspension from the sacrament of the Lord's Supper for a season, and by excommunication from the church, according to the nature of the crime and demerit of the person. So those are the three stages. That's question number four. What are the steps of discipline? Uh, admonition, suspension, and excommunication. And basically, we've gone over the various texts. Uh, the most, the clearest of them all is Matthew 18, Jesus' words um, in connection with that. Uh, five, respond to those who say that the church is not to judge anyone, that having a church and that a loving church would never censor a wayward member. I think Frankie just uh, helped answer that in part. Anybody got anything more to say about that? You said uh, love properly defined is obedience. Therefore, obedience censure is loving. Okay. Well, let me give you an example. Um, there was a young member of the church who was very offended because another young member of the church went and rebuked his sister because she was going out with a non-Christian. 
And he was deeply offended by that and said, what are you doing getting into her business? You are such a busybody and all of this. And harbored some pretty bitter resentment over it, of it for years. And then finally came and talked to me and we spent a number of hours uh, talking about the whole situation, very, very embittered. And I think what finally got to him was, I said, look, if you saw a friend of yours driving the car and there were cliffs, and you know he keeps going, he's going to drive over the cliffs, do you think you have any responsibility to try to warn him that the path that he, the road that he is on is going to take him right over the cliffs and he is going to crash and burn and die? Do you not have some responsibility? I said, that's all that was happening here. They saw, they, they saw disaster coming for your sister. They saw tragedy in the making. And they're supposed to, if you love someone, do you not intervene? You know, does, the not, does the Lord love whom he disciplines? You know, Hebrews 12, you know, does a father not discipline his son whom he loves? Is it, is it not the responsibility? Um, you know, I don't think it's something you do every day. I don't think you do it on small matters, um, trivial things. But I think that there are um, you know, moments you know, moments of great importance and of, of um, a serious consequence where you, you do have a responsibility to go and say, you are about to drive over a cliff. You are going to destroy yourself. You are going to destroy your life or your children or something. You continue on that path. Do we? Don't we have that responsibility? Yes. But to do it in a loving way. Right. Yeah, that it would be performed I don't want to do it in a way. Phineas, yeah. Yeah, now you get Yes, no, but Old Testament examples are not always so loving. Like, there's unity in this, and, you know, we've been talking about all New Testament passages here, but there's a lot of unity in um, this concept in the, in, this, in the Old and New Testaments as well. You know, you got Phineas, like, stabbing people in their tents. You got... I don't advise that. Well, maybe not. <laughs> you know... Loving a quick to who, I think, is the... Proper yeah. Question. So the person you rebuke might not feel like it was that. Level. Yeah. So so I'm assuming, and I think that's right. I think they they are prone not to think it's loving. But the Lord lo whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. So that love is the whole motivation, right? This case with the sister, it was you know they were close friends, and the friend was going as a friend and saying, "What are you doing?" And it was deeply resented, but it was the right thing to do. And even her brother eventually came to see that it was, that it was, and that it was motivated by love and concern. Yeah, and you're right too. It can be done in unloving ways, like what? What are you? You're such an idiot. Why are you doing? You know, you know, screaming and hollering and, and um, uh, humiliating. And but but to be firm though, you don't need to run them through with a spear. But to be firm. Um, grace and truth. If Christ was full of grace and full of truth, then speaking and the truth, so you can do that. You can yeah, do right. it. Yeah. Call it fair, so it. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, I wish those who are troubling you would go all the way into masculinity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's, that's, not, uh, that's not very loving. <laughs> Take it up with Paul. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, uh, but I, I am mm -hmm. a little more than a little hesitant to take on language that the apostles and prophets can use with divine inspiration. And what I am, when I, when I have a limited perspective, a finite, limited perspective, and so I'm going to be a little more temperate, probably. But we can't say it is inherently wrong to do this. Okay. You, you probably shouldn't. You should be very reluctant to. Yeah, all, all of those are good things but we can't say it's wrong to yeah. do it. Say, I would just be so happy if people just were a little more vigilant to when they see someone heading for the cliffs to, to not be a cowardly and to go ahead and say, what are you doing? Please, please. Yeah, Warren? Uh, we've been dealing with individual objections to this point here. Uh, I'd like to ask a slightly different question. What about the issue of church leadership sessions backing off of church leadership, especially I've come across a couple situations because they're creating legal consequences. Have you dealt with that? Not just here, but in Presbyterian things like that. Churches are afraid of being sued or being accosted because if they pursue proper church discipline. 
You know, this thing is being recorded for posterity, so I'm a little guarded about what I say. But my early years here, um, I could not in good conscience marry a, a daughter of this church to a practicing Roman Catholic. And if you'll recall, we saw a few paragraphs back that that, that in fact is confessional. Um, that uh, believers are not to marry uh, infidels, or no, Rome, uh, you know, Roman Catholics and other papists and other idolaters. Uh, others idolaters. Okay, so so I refused to do the wedding of a daughter of the church who never attended. That was another problem. Um, and the Roman Catholic fellow. So then we got a letter from a firm in town threatening to sue us if we didn't um, if we didn't perform the wedding. And then my session got weak need. So this was a good group of men, but they weren't all that, they were a lot better than what I inherited when I got here, but they didn't have the stomach for it and they wouldn't back me. So we had to come up with a compromise that ended up being satisfactory for all, which was they could have the church, they could have the service at the building, but no minister of the church would perform it. And they had to get a male, heterosexual, orthodox Protestant minister to perform the service. So of course they went to First Presbyterian. <laughs> and they found someone, you know, agreeable to us and they had the, they had the wedding. And we had Art Broadwood come and attend to make sure nothing fishy went on. <laughs> so, yes, I think that sometimes the church does lose its nerve because we're in a litigious society. And I don't think they could, in, I don't think they could win in court. It's right there in the confession. It's in our documents that we can't do those weddings. Uh, but do we want to go to court? Do we want the bad publicity? Do we want to, the, the expense? Do we want the headache and all that that goes with some kind of a court trial? Um, again, the session went weak need. They lost their nerve. I think these days it more often comes up regarding accusations of abuse, and which often wind up in the criminal realm. Some of those police and files are criminal complaints. Yeah, it's a, it's a scary environment today because that language gets hurled about rather loosely of abuse and. Um, you know, if you're thinking abuse is a black eye or something, um, you know, it's, it's so broadly defined that it, you know, you really just language, abuse, uh, language of disapproval, language of disapproval, uh, disapproving of a lifestyle, harsh, you know, harsh, considered harsh denunciations of, of lifestyle and so forth that can be seen as abusive relationship, pastoral abuse. And listen, thank you for bringing this up because I want to throw this into the mix. Um, I think that for every abusive pastor, there are a hundred abusive churches. That's what I want to hear about, churches that abuse. Because you, you, you get a bunch of ministers together, you wouldn't believe the horror stories you hear. How mean, how cruel, how brutal. Uh, churches can be when they, they decide they don't like their minister and they turn on him and beat him up. And uh, for every story of abusive pastors, I'm telling you, there are dozens and dozens of abusive churches. All right, let's take a five-minute break. <laughs>